Estás viendo Canal América, Televisión Dominicana para el Mundo. Sometimes life can be so damn hard. You don't know where to go. Everything keeps falling apart. Yeah. You try to do your best, but only God knows that you've given everything you've got, but the world takes you down. You just keep moving on at your feet. Welcome to a Time for Truth show. I'm your host, Dr. Bernard Fialkoff, and it's a pleasure to be back with you again today. And many of you have been asking how to get the previous shows, so you can get those by going on YouTube on a Time for True Show, a Time for True Show on YouTube, and there you can subscribe, and then you'll have all the previous segments and programming that we've done. Today we have something very important in terms of those members of our society that went off the rails, that had difficulty when they were younger or at some point in their life, and what's happened to them and the uh, problems they've gotten into. And we're going to present a very important person who's going to present a program that's changing the future of these community members. And Buddha, if you put his pictures up on the screen, I want to introduce to our viewers our guest, Matthew Robinson, originally of Richmond, Virginia, who obtained his Master's of Science in Physics and quantum mechanics from Virginia State University. He continued his postgraduate studies in strategic business at Pace University, in marketing analysis and business planning at Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, business and marketing at Harvard University, American University, University of Kansas, University of Chicago. Mr. Robinson, is an illustrious career, has spanned so many positions, I'll try to cover some of them, as a worldwide marketing executive for IBM, former president of Family Life Improvement Center of Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., a Narconon drug rehabilitation expert, director for the Washington, D.C. Urban League Training Center for Women, executive director for the community-based Learning Extension Program for the DC Public School System, which delivered Hubbard Study Technology in Reading and Math Tutoring in three public schools and two private Catholic schools for over 18 years, and is an educational mentor for university and graduate students, again in the Hubbard Study Technology at Georgetown. George Washington University, Howard University, and the University of District of Columbia, having done so for over 10 years. As a member of Ebony Awakening Association of African American Professionals, he has been dedicated to eradicating drugs, crime, and illiteracy in the black communities of the United States. Matt's passion and natural talents in empowering and advocating for those who have been suppressed and too often forgotten in our communities led him to become president for the Criminon New Life DC. There in Criminon for 18 years, he has rehabilitated criminals, narcotics and drug substance abusers, and at-risk youth populations in the Washington DC metro area. His professional honors include the IBM Award for Outstanding Community Leadership, multiple Golden Circle Awards for Outstanding Sales Production, the District of Columbia Community Service Award, and for his breakthrough accomplishments, his co-founding, his leadership, 
he was presented with a prestigious, outstanding achievement award from the International Association for Better Living and Education. He's quite an illustrious and diverse human being. And it's our pleasure on A Time for Truth to have him. And we want to welcome Buddha, if you put him up on the screen live, welcome Mr. Matt Robinson. Hello to all of you. Hello. I'm happy to be here with you today, Bill. You know what? <clears throat> you've got so much that you've done. I want to get right into it because I know you have a lot to talk about and your CV is so impressive. I'm sure the first thing that our viewers would like to know is your secret for all this productivity. Yeah, I don't know if it's so much of a secret, but it's been a motivation I've had for many years uh, to help others. And you kind of will wonder, well, how does that link into productivity? Well, a couple things. Um, one, I think early on in my childhood, I learned that uh, it was a major benefit for helping others. I mean, when others did well, I did well. You know, when others are flourishing and prospering in my environment, I flourish and prosper. So how do you hook that with productivity? I am a student of L. Ron Hubbard technology. And one of the things I learned was that production is the base for morale. And I have noticed over the years when I'm helping people, it makes me happy. It brings me joy. So my productivity is always sort of uh, launched out of my attention on other people, on empowering them in some manner and helping them to excel, to flourish, to prosper. And out of that, uh, I get immense joy. So uh, that's been my motivation, uh, just sort of selfishly knowing that when others around me are doing well, then I'm going to be doing even better probably or just as good. So I work hard and the productivity was always a joy. It was never an effort, never, never, never. So uh, that's really where, that's my basic secret. When I have my attention out from myself on other people, uh, helping them to expand, to flourish, to prosper, the productivity just flow. It's just a natural thing. Very good. So basically production, is the basis of morale for our viewers and so what i want to ask you is because you have such a diverse background with quantum mechanics physics ibm education mm. how did you become the Kremenon dc president uh, that's an interesting story i uh previously to working in Kremenon for about 18 years i had I've uh, been involved in leading uh, the delivery of services in the Washington, D.C. area in uh, study technology. It is, a, uh, it is a, an approach to learning. Uh, actually, uh, it teaches you how to learn, all right, how to comprehend. Uh, and so I was doing that in many of the uh, elementary school, middle schools. Uh, on college campuses, did that for about 18 years and then came to an end. So I had a bit of a break in between and at the end of that break, uh, I heard about a small group that was beginning to create a criminal group in Washington, D.C. So I went to some of the meetings. Uh, they were board meetings that they had, they invited me to sit in, they were planning meetings. And uh, after going to several of those meetings and participating, and with my extensive work in the community, because I was very well linked into the community, the neighborhoods, I had uh, very good networking in that area. Uh, they offered me the position of being executive director of Criminon. So I started off in uh, 2004 as uh, executive director. And uh, we went into two uh, of the DC Department of Correction detention facilities. 
And so uh, from there, I worked that job as executive director for about 10 years. And then the last uh, six to eight years, I've been the president. So uh, that's how I came about the president job. The board of directors voted that in uh, because I had a slightly different vision where I wanted to take the group. They agreed on it. They voted me in. And uh, I've been happily doing that. Beautiful. Well, tell us more about Criminon. Well, you know, what is Criminon? How does it work? Tell us about that, please. Yeah, well, Criminon is a secular program. It is a nonprofit program. We're fully tax exempt federally. Um, it is part of an international network. So there are Criminon programs in many other countries around the world. Uh, the, the group, the chapter, if you will, the organization that is in Washington, D.C. is called Criminon New Life D.C. And over, we've been around for about 18 years. And previous to the 18 years of working in the proper city of D.C., we also worked in maximum security in Virginia. Uh, D.C. not being a state uh, previously had a prison in the neighboring state of Virginia where we did deliver criminal services. That closed down in 2001 about, and uh, we were invited uh, to come into the new facilities, the detention facilities in the actual city. So um, we've delivered now in the city to about 15,000, maybe a little bit over 15 to 18,000 inmates these are offenders uh, they include both local and federal offenders the federal offenders you know as felons uh, the local guys are in violation of DC uh, codes and uh, what we do we deliver to women men we've delivered to juveniles we also deliver to halfway houses uh, and to community-based groups that are involved in criminal justice. So, um, Criminon has basically four goals. I think you flashed them up, but I'll go over them quickly. Uh, I could spend an hour talking about them. But one is that we are basically a rehabilitation group. So, your audience can understand, I do not do housing. <laughs> we do not do uh employment we do not do job readiness training we do not do clothing food transportation health care i can go through the list of things that offenders need okay what we do is rehabilitation and we are experts at it i mean we are world renowned experts we have proven technology we have evidence-based technology that actually work so uh, in the rehabilitation, what we do is we work with our students to have them come to a restoration, a rehabilitation point for themselves. We don't force this on them. They have to have their own realizations of them restoring their own self-respect. Um, one of the things that Mr. Hubbard said is that there's no criminal in the world who cannot track back his starting crime to the point where he lost his own self-respect. So one of the principles of Criminon is to help our students restore that self-respect. Because if he doesn't have respect for himself, he can't respect you. So if I'm a drug dealer and I'm a criminal and I want to shoot you because you're in my territory, and you're standing on the wrong corner at the wrong time, I can do that with sometimes with no conscience. But I can't do that if I have true respect, a sense of worth for myself. Because now I'm looking at you as a human being, not just a piece of meat or an obstacle in my way that's standing in my territory. So we get them to restore the self-respect. Along with that comes their dignity, their restoration of their honor, their restoration of their trustworthiness. So that's part of the rehabilitation 
Uh, the other thing we work on is we stop the cycle of, re, of uh, recidivism. And recidivism, for you who may not know, is just the, the endless cycle of someone being arrested, convicted, incarcerated, getting out, being arrested, convicted, and incarcerated, either for the same crime or another crime. And that cycle goes around and around and around. I've had people in my criminal class, 56 years old. I asked him, how many times have you been in prison? Tells me 17 times, starting when he was 13 years old, been in and out 17 times, and he doesn't know when he's going to end. So those are the guys that we get, all right? Um, so we try to stop that cycle. It is important to end that cycle. Uh, another thing that we're very interested in doing is we want to prepare people to return back to the community. Not just, you know, they finish the sentence and put them out. You want them to be participating citizens when they return. And you want them to be well integrated into the family structure when they go back. All right. So that process of transitioning from incarceration back to society, back to your community, back to your family is called reentry. And what we are returning are returning citizens, people who can participate. All right. And I would think that the last thing that we do in criminal is we advocate. And by advocating, I mean, we stand up for, we recommend changes to the justice system to improve it. Uh, we're talking about the criminal justice system. It's in need of reform as all of you listening to me know. So we work very hard at advocating uh, correct laws, improve policies, uh, we work with city council in getting the proper budget that's needed to do the things that really will bring about rehabilitation and not just punishment, all right? So uh, that's a quick summary of Criminon. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I could be here for hours telling you about Criminon. Well, you know what, Matt? I think that was very thorough and very informative and very makes it very clear in fact, you know, I know there are some friends of mine who are involved in the criminal and the penal system here in, in New York State to the work that I've mm. done. And so, you know, I'm definitely going to get them this show. And uh, one of them works here just north of the city and uh, is a member of one of the organizations that I belong to. And uh, I'm sure he's going to be very interested in speaking to you. Uh, engineer, do we have his video up ready? So what we're going to do for the viewers now, Mr. Robinson, is let's play that video on the actual success stories from the criminals themselves and those that re-entered society. Let's go ahead. Terrific. The way of happiness changed my outlook, you know, helped me learn, you know, learn things and understand. Help me how to, you know, I mean, get along with people and, you know, basically just live my life, you know, happy, free, you know, even though I'm in jail. And after I finished, you know, completed the program, this, um, What's Your Happiness program, we had, um, like different, different, um, you know, chapters like love one another, respect your neighbors and stuff, you know, made me think every time somebody does something to me, like, oh, just got through coming out of this program, got to learn to respect one another, love one another, you know, so, you know, it made me think twice and stuff. But now that I got in the Way to Happiness program, it changed everything. Like, I respect my family more. You know, I now I know what love is, you know. I express it to them and they express it back and it feels good. So now I know this way to happen is trying to just help me, you know. It's just it's great. I think it should be mandatory in juvenile hall that you join a criminal program. I think that should be mandatory. If you're going to be in juvenile hall, you have to be in this program. I don't think you can put a price tag on self-forgiveness. It's priceless. 
It really is. I mean, if you operate, if you operate in essentially self-hatred, which was my entire life until I did this program, um, there's not much you can do in any area of life. And the way to happen this course is a way to instill confidence within yourself and open yourself up to other channels where you can know you can complete things on your own. The way to happiness, what it did for me was to give me back my personal integrity. It gave me a, a way that I could regain my self-esteem and get back into society as a productive citizen. One thing that I noticed when I completed the Criminon program, and I noticed it when others completed it also, was that besides replacing the bad areas of their beliefs and their values and judgments and replacing them with good things, they would take it a step further. They wanted to improve their life in every area that they could with what they had. It's like when I look back at the prison life and what I was involved with, because there was Criminon giving me those different programs, I, I didn't spend my time in prison. I really made an investment and, you know, for my future. And, and people say, gosh, you get into prison and you take a lot of things out of prison. Well, I took a lot of things, but things that I took were really good. And because they were available, if there's nothing good available, uh, you know, you're going to bring out something worse than what you went in with, that's for sure. Well, you know what? Listening to those people that you rehabilitated is the proof of the whole thing for me because, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's horrible what happens when they just go that cycle of coming out going right back in again, coming out, going right yeah. back in again. So I was going to ask you is what, what is it that really happens? What, what, let's go a little bit into what's the plight of these criminals when they come out of prison. If they haven't rehabilitated with criminal, what ends up happening? Like, well, how does this happen? Just this continually round and round and round. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of that cycle round and round and round is that uh, when you're in prison, uh, rehabilitation uh, is a tough thing to come by, all right? For those who come to criminal classes, we've heard about some of them there, uh, and those were excellent statements, and they're all true. Uh, you come to criminal, you do the program, that's what you're going to get. But everyone doesn't come to criminal. So you get a lot of people going in, uh, the system delivered punishment, all right? not rehabilitation, punishment, all right? And uh, there may be a few that try and get a GED or a few take an art class and then they're back out on the street. And that system doesn't stop that cycle. But when they're back on the street, even if they've had some taste of rehabilitation inside, they have a myriad of barriers to face you know, imagine, if you will, just a scenario, someone being locked up for 20 years. They, they left their kid when they were, the kid was three years old. They uh, have three or four kids there, right? You uh, get arrested in D.C., the judge sends you to North Carolina or, I don't know, Utah, because you're going to a federal prison to do 20 years, all right? Your family cannot just get up and bring those four or five kids to come see you in Utah. That's not going to happen. And it busts up families. So we're putting these guys back out on the street. They, they need housing. Let me tell you my top five things that I've seen occur to guys leaving prison or in some cases jail. Number one, they need housing. They need emergency housing. When they're on the street, in the middle of the winter and they have no place to go, that's a need for emergency housing. If they don't have family to go to or a girlfriend or a wife, what are they gonna do? That, that's a barrier that's gotta get handled that criminal is working hard to try to fix. Uh, then you need to transition to permanent housing. That's tricky because what you may not know is the millions of people getting out of jails and prisons every year, millions, 10 to 12 million, go back on the street 
that and that's because of that recycling uh recidivism all right um there are and i've done the research on this there are at least 44,000 44,000 laws and policies designed as sanctions against someone coming out of prison i mean just to give you a quick example when you come out and you want emergency housing section eight gives you some uh low cost rental housing that you can live in for a period of time and that's afforded to most public citizens well section eight doesn't apply if you've committed certain crimes so what are you going to do when you don't have any money you don't have a job employment is another one housing is first i think employment i think is second you know some of these guys coming out are a bit poor they're poor readers uh some of them don't have a ged right uh they need some kind of job training or skill imagine being locked down and shut down for 20 years 15 years and having to come back into this digital car this economy and and you don't know anything about digital you don't know how to use a smartphone you don't even know how to use a car to get on the metro okay you have to relearn all of that so it's job placement you need license you know people have to get a license if you've got certain crime Certain people don't want to license you, okay? It is hard for an employee or a corporation to call you back for a second interview when he knows you are a two-time felon. He isn't going to ring you up and say, well, come back in for your third and final uh, inter inter interview, all right? Uh, so that's housing and employment. I would think the third one would be, uh, I'm going to put number three being alcohol and drug abuse treatment that they need and the reason why I'm putting that third along with by the way mental health just quickly what you may not know is that there's more people with mental health illnesses in our prisons and jails than there are in the public hospitals where they're supposed to be probably all right in our jails so our jails and hospitals and prisons are sort of daycare centers for people with mental illness problems. Unbelievable. Um, man, I was going to say, I hate to cut you off, uh, but we're yeah. getting the end of the show. What is number four? Number four, I would think, would be just reunification with families. Okay? okay. Just coming back and reunifying with your family uh, is a tough one. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? We're going to probably have to continue this again in another show. But to me, it really makes a statement that these men and women in our penal system and in our correction facilities really need to be rehabilitated because if I was there for whatever reason, that's what I would want. And I tend to go by that philosophy of trying to give someone else what I would want if I was in that position. So first of all, thank you for being on the show. Well, my pleasure. And I'm glad that you're doing Criminon. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you, what is your email address? You can get a hold of me at uh, president, right? The whole word president at Criminon New Life DC, all spelled out, Criminon New Life DC dot org. Uh, you can also go to that uh, domain and you'll see our website. Excellent. Well, Mr. Matt Robinson, thank you for what you're doing with Criminon and rehabilitating these men and women. Thank you for being on the show. And for those of you watching, if you're interested in Criminon, get a hold of President Matt Robinson. Thank you for tuning in. And let's Please. create, absolutely, and let's create a very uplifting society where the technology is just not material but also is spiritual and for humanity. We'll see you on the next time for a Time for Truth show. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Sometimes life can be so damn hard. You don't know where to go. Everything is falling apart. Yeah. You try to do your best by 
Only God knows that you've given everything you've got But the world takes you down You just keep moving on Let your feet 